chapter 3, verse 1. It says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. You know, as I read the word of God, I look at that verse 2, and right away the first five verses in verse 2, I circle and I love it. Just look at those first five words. This man came to Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? This man came to Jesus. You guys, he's calling us this morning. He's always calling us to himself. By the way, God is always the initiator. Oh, Nicodemus decided to go to him. Is that what happened? Yes. But what happened first? Nicodemus was drawn by Jesus. He's not initiating. He's responding. You guys, that's always us too. The Lord is always initiating in our life. He's the one that draws us to himself to get saved. And then as we're his children and we walk with him, he keeps drawing us to himself and we respond. So what we need to point out right away in the story is we see this man. He's a ruler of the Jews. Nicodemus. He comes to Jesus by night, but that's because he is feeling drawn, pulled to the Lord, attracted to the Lord. Now, what has been going on is this is at the beginning of the ministry of Jesus, of, of his three-year ministry. Jesus had come for his first Passover. We studied that he cleansed the temple, right? And then it says they're not just, it's, we're not told what he was doing. He was performing miracles. They're called signs. He was doing signs and he was teaching so now all of the people that are there for the Passover in Jerusalem are drawn to Jesus. He's doing miracles. They heard his teaching. Everyone has heard it spread like wildfire. Then he came in and cleansed the temple. And so now, obviously, the Sanhedrin, it says he was a ruler of the Jews, Nicodemus. There was a body of 71 men, 70 men and then one more of the high priest. They were like the Supreme Court over Israel. And right now, Israel at this time is ruled by the Romans. And yet they let the Jewish nation pretty much take care of everything except for capital punishment. That's the one thing they took away from them. So this is, and they're in Jerusalem where Jesus is, and this man, Nicodemus, would have been one of those 71 men. So, you know, I wrote this down this morning. Psalm, I'll read it to you. Psalm 42, verses 1 and 2. <coughs> As the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. You know what? Then I looked at the next sentence, and it said, When shall I come and appear before God? I thought that just fit so great. It fits with our life, but look at Nicodemus. He doesn't realize he is sitting in front of God, Almighty God, the Son of God, God the Son. But why is he there? Psalm 42, the deer pants for the water brooks. Deer never stray far from streams. They come back and drink often. So pants our soul for the Lord. He made us for himself. When shall I come and appear before God? Nicodemus, you're sitting before him right now on this evening. He doesn't realize it yet. Now, I added this this morning, John 6, 44. Jesus said, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. You guys, God's so gentle. We talked last week at Easter Sunday about him speaking to us. We're going to talk about that some more this morning. We got together as elders and prayed this morning. And Joe is one of our elders. And I was so encouraged. The Lord just wants to encourage all of us all of the time. You mean the Lord spoke even this morning? He did. He spoke through his word. We're praying. Joe didn't know I had this in my notes. I just added it this morning. I felt like the Lord told me this morning. Okay, what are you talking about? Read it to us. Well, in John 6, 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Joe prayed that this morning, not knowing I had added this. He said, Lord, you, because we always pray for you guys. As we're here in the morning, we know you're at home fighting the battle to get up and get here, right? <laughs> and everything. It's hard to get here. Isn't it hard to get here? And then sometimes, you know, we, we can be having struggles on the way here. All kinds of things can happen. Uh, the enemy doesn't want us to come on Sunday. And so we pray. And so we always pray for all the households, what's going on, Lord. Bring them to worship you. Let them be, let them be drawn to you, Lord. Let it be your Holy Spirit that brings people here for you. 
And so Job prayed this. And when I heard that, I mean, when you're saying when you heard that, you knew that was the Lord confirming it was God himself telling Job to say that. Well, God told me to get up and add that to the notes this morning. It fits with Nicodemus because that's what's going on. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Nicodemus comes to him at night. What's going on? God is drawing him to Jesus. And you guys, he does that in our life every day. Are you aware of that? Are you and I aware of that? Life is so busy. There's so many distractions. And maybe we're like, even right now, inside, you're like the you're like the dryer at home. You know, maybe you put the clothes in the dryer when you left, and it's going, ah. And sometimes inside, that's our mind and our heart. Like the dryer, the dryer just tumbling, right? Take out the load, put another load in, right? And, and it's like, maybe you're sitting there still in your chair right now, but inside, your mind and your heart is like, I don't have peace, I don't have rest. Augustine, one of the early church fathers, he said this as if he's praying to the Lord. He says, thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it finds its rest in thee. So think of Nicodemus coming that night. He's restless. He has not found his rest yet. Oh, he's in the right place. He's with Jesus. God has drawn him. His heart is hungering and thirsting for the Lord like ours. But he needs to drink deeply. Now, let's add two more words to those first five words in verse 2. If you'll look there with me again, please. This man, this man came to Jesus, look what those next two words say, by night. Now, if Nicodemus had come to Jesus on an official visit, in other words, that ruling body of the Sanhedrin, 70 other men sent him to say, go find out what this guy is about, right? It would probably have taken place during the daytime. Remember, if you've been with us in prior studies, this same body of Jewish leaders had sent a delegation of priests and Levites from the Pharisees in Jerusalem to John the Baptist to ask him when he was baptizing and all the people were going out to him, who are you? And in the day, they went right out in front of everyone and said, who are you? Well, he's coming by night. So because of that, he's probably coming on his own. And as we learn Nicodemus's character in the gospel, it's clear that he's not a man who would, who would have come as a secret representative of the Jewish rulers. I mean, he's all out front. He's coming to Jesus. And yet in verse 2, if you look there, Nicodemus doesn't say, I know that you are a teacher come from God. He says, we know, plural. So, probably wasn't sent as an ambassador for the whole ruling uh, Sanhedrin, but he could have been speaking for a few other leaders like himself that are in Sanhedrin who are wondering about Jesus. Or you guys, just like us, Nicodemus, what he could have been doing is using that plural word, we, intentionally because of its vagueness. You see, I can say, hey, I, I, I want to know this right here. And that's more personal. You got to take more responsibility for that. What's more vague is we. We know, Lord. And, it's, it, and the intention isn't so much on you, you see. So he could be avoiding that singular word, I, in caution, so that he doesn't have to commit himself too much. Maybe that's where you're at here today. You know Jesus is calling you. You're drawn to him. You know he's speaking in your heart. You're still cautious. You haven't completely embraced him. And he's calling you this morning to just surrender to his love and not to be cautious. And instead of saying, we want to know more about you, Lord, to really be honest and say, Lord, I want you. I hunger and thirst for you. I need you desperately. So, probably not on an official visit, but on a personal one to Jesus, seeking to know for himself the secret of the miracles that Jesus is performing. And you guys, especially to ask Jesus about the coming kingdom of God that Jesus says is now here. You know, a simple definition for the kingdom of God is where the king is on the throne ruling. Jesus said the kingdom of God is within you. Have you given your heart to the Lord? Is he living within you? Is he on the throne? The kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of God is going to come soon. And 
life is not going to go on here on planet Earth on and on and on as it is. The rapture is going to happen. Seven years of tribulation. Jesus will come back and rule for a thousand years on this earth. And then there will be a new heaven and a new earth. You guys, it is time is passing away. Okay. So. Verse 2. Notice Nicodemus begins to speak to Jesus. He addresses him as rabbi. That's a title of great respect the Jews use for their religious teachers. This is humility because Nicodemus is putting himself in the position of a learner seeking to inquire about the great truths that Jesus had been teaching. Now, he's a wealthy man. We know that. 500 years before the Lord Jesus was born in the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament, in chapter 53, verse 9, talking about Jesus dying on the cross, it says, And they made his, Jesus' grave, with the wicked. What does that mean? He, he hung on the cross between two thieves. They made his grave with the wicked. But with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. So he hung between two thieves, but then they made his grave with the rich at his death. With the rich. Hold your place there. We're in John. If you'll turn back, go to chapter 19 in the same book. And go to verse 38, if you would. And we're going to look at Nicodemus a little bit more. And uh, this is the day Jesus died on the cross. And he has now died on the cross. And in John 19, verse 38, it says, After this, Joseph of Arimathea, you guys, he was one of those 71 ruling men. Joseph of Arimathea, notice, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate, the Roman governor, that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission, so he came and took the body of Jesus. Now here's Nicodemus, our character today. And Nicodemus, who, notice these two words, at first, came to Jesus by night. John, why'd you put that in there? There's a reason. Also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds. You guys, that would be very, very expensive. So we know that he's a rich man. So would linen. Then they took the body of Jesus and bound it in strips of linen with the spices as the custom of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. And we know from the other gospel accounts that that tomb belonged to Joseph of Arimathea. And it was going to be his tomb. It was a brand new tomb, and he now gives it to the Lord. So verse 42, one more verse. So there they laid Jesus because of the Jews' preparation day, for the tomb was nearby. So we know that Nicodemus in our story today is a wealthy man. Um... Hold your place right there just for a minute. Or actually, if you'll turn on your way back to chapter 3, let's stop at chapter 7. Go to John chapter 7, and let's go to verse 30. And as you turn there, I'll remind us that we're reading that Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. Now, we already read in, in chapter 19 that John keeps saying that because he thinks it's important in his thinking. And there's two other places where he mentions the same thing um, that he came at night. And we just read in chapter 19, at first he came by night. Here's the second place. This was just a little earlier in the ministry of Jesus before he died. Things are starting to heat up. The priests want to arrest him before they actually crucified him. They had wanted to do it earlier. And we'll pick it up in verse 30. It says, Therefore they, that ruling Sanhedrin, sought to take him, Jesus, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. Because you guys, God is in control of everything. And he's in control of our lives today, no matter how confusing things seem to be or whatever's going on. Verse 31, And many of the people believed in him and said, when the Christ comes, which means Messiah, will he do more signs or miracles than these which this man has done? The Pharisees heard the crowd murmuring these things concerning him, and the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. Okay, skip and jump down to verse 44. Now some of them wanted to take him, but no one laid hands on him. 
Then the officers, they came back, came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to them, why have you not brought him? And the officers answered, no man ever spoke like this man. Then the Pharisees answered them, are you also deceived? Now I love verse 48, look what they ask. Have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed in him? What's the answer to that question? What did we just read in chapter 19? Joseph of Arimathea was a secret disciple. Nicodemus was a secret disciple. They were both part of the ruling party, but afraid to step forward until the day Jesus died. And then in one of the other gospel accounts, it says Joseph of Arimathea, taking courage, came forward and asked for the body. Have any of the rulers, verse 48, of the Pharisees believed in him? Yes, but they don't think so. But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. Now here we have it again. Verse 50. Nicodemus, and John writes again, who, he, who came to Jesus by night, he keeps including that, being one of them, said to them, and now we see the character of Nicodemus. Does our law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he is doing? They answered and said to him, Are you also from Galilee? Search and look, for no prophet has arisen out of Galilee. And everyone went to his own house. So let's turn back to John 3, 3. We'll pick up our story. But putting the scriptures we just read together, we've now read in John's gospel, everything that he's got about Nicodemus been in three places. He says he came by night. In other words, John keeps beating that drum. He's letting us know that Nicodemus came by night, probably because he did not want anyone to know of his visit to Jesus. How about you and I? We can want to walk with the Lord in secret or in quiet. And there's that day where we just fall deeper in love with the Lord. And we care more about what the Lord thinks and what anybody else thinks. And, um, if someone asked you at work or in your neighborhood or anywhere, you're waiting in an airport or anything, and they just said, hey, what's your life all about? I mean, what are you into? What's the passion of your life? What would you say? Would you say, Jesus Christ, he's my Lord and my God. He's risen from the dead. He's wonderful. He's amazing. He changed my life. He saved me. I'm his disciple. I'm his child. I serve him. Do you know him? Because he has changed my life. He has given me peace and joy and love. And you need him. Do you know him? Let me tell you about him. And then they go, whoa. <laughs> what did I ask, right? Or would we say that, you see? He comes by night. Secretly. Well, let's look at verse 3. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. In verse 5 there, when Jesus said, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he's saying unless one, unless one is born physically and spiritually. Now, he comes and he says, Lord, we know you're a teacher from God, and you guys, the Lord, he sees our hearts, he knows what we need, and he goes directly to the need of Nicodemus. You know, he doesn't, waste words and he doesn't with us either he's so loving and firm and direct Jesus tells Nicodemus exactly what he needs to hear by the way don't you love this story because you know as I read it this week um, I don't know about you I think you probably do the same thing I always picture the stories in the Bible in my mind and you know it doesn't mean it's right but God gave us this wonderful gift of imagination well it's nighttime they would sit they're in Jerusalem Jesus is, is at someone's home some borrowed home. They all had flat roofs on top, and in the evening they would go up and sit there. I picture a breeze blowing, you know, the wind blowing maybe, the breeze. Um, and they're up there to stay cool, and they're relaxing in the evening. And I'm so drawn to this because it's a man. 
Isn't it so attractive? Coming, having a quiet time, the undivided attention of Jesus Christ and speaking to him and him speaking to you. If that is not attractive, that is so attractive. Our soul hungers and thirsts after God. That's what we hunger and thirst for as we read this story. Jesus said, you must be born again. Now, Nicodemus is not asking why. He's asking how. He says, I know I was born physically once. Can a man go back in his mother's womb again and be born again a second time? That's exactly what he's saying. Now, listen. Jesus is trying to make this so clear and simple that this man would understand. He knows that 2,000 years later, we're going to be reading this today. But don't forget the context. That man needs to understand that night. Sometimes we read more into scripture or come up with these deep meanings that maybe aren't there. And what that would mean is the man who he's talking to that night doesn't have any idea what he's talking about and doesn't understand. Because Jesus is trying to broadcast the meaning to us. And we have more knowledge in these uh, later, latter days of the word of God. So he's... We know the deeper meaning now, but Nicodemus didn't know there. See, that's a mistake we made. Don't ever do that. Remember the context. Jesus knew we would be looking at this today, but he cared about that man that night understanding. What are you saying? That he's going to make it as simple and clear as he can. And people come, with, come up with all kinds of meanings of what Jesus meant. And you try to make it fit. And there is no way Nicodemus would have understood that that night. And yet Jesus wants him to understand that night. So what are you saying? Nicodemus isn't saying, why do I need to be born again? He's saying, how? How can you be born again? I know I was born once from my mother. Can a man when he's old, which kind of lets us know Nicodemus is older. He's talking about himself. Can a man when he is old go back into his mother's womb and be born again? Now, Jesus is not trying to conceal truth. He's trying to reveal truth. When a woman goes into labor, when your mom went into labor, it's like time to go to the hospital because what? My water just broke. We were within our mother's womb in this amniotic fluid that God created, protecting us, and we're growing in there. And there's that day, and only God knows, and doctors still don't know today what starts labor. Isn't that amazing? They don't know what triggers it. They haven't figured that out yet. It belongs to God. I love that. So many things still belong to God. Anyway, to be born of water is to be born physically. So, I want you to think of this. Nicodemus, Jesus wants him to understand. He wants us to understand. He says, you must be born again. Let me say that again. You must be born again. Let me say that again. You must be born again. To do something again is to do it over, right? So he says, you must be born again. And he goes, I know I was born once. To be born again, what do I do? Go back into my mother's womb when I'm old and be born again? What are you talking about? Jesus says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. A man must be born of water, physical birth, and the spirit. Spiritual birth. That's what he's simply saying here. Now, hold your place there. Go to the first book in the Bible, the New Testament, if you would. Genesis chapter 2. And let's go to verse 15. And this is going to help us understand. God created Adam and Eve from the dust of the earth. We talked about that last week. And in Genesis 2, 15, first book of the Bible, it says, Then the Lord God took the man, Adam, and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. Now notice this. For in the day, in other words, on that day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now, just hold your place there for a minute. 
I'm going to read you some words from Dr. Henry Morris, M. Morris, who founded the Institute for Creation Research in 1970. He's now in heaven with the Lord. Now listen, that tree of knowledge of good and evil, that means we go up, we take the fruit like Adam and Eve did. Eve, we know, sinned first. Well, it says Adam did. Well, that's because God had given, created Adam first and given him the authority in the home to lead. So he holds the responsibility for the sin to Adam, not to Eve. To both of them, but to, to Adam. Well, okay, if we were there, take some of that fruit. I don't know what evil's like. And what Dr. Henry Moore says is there wasn't some magical substance in the fruit of the tree that would give knowledge of evil to those of us who had ate. You know, if you eat this because there's evil in it and you'll know, that's not the idea. Here's the idea, you guys. Eating of the fruit of this tree after it had been specifically forbidden by God would indeed give man a very real knowledge of evil. And then he gives a definition of evil. Simply defined, he says, evil is what? Rejection of God's will. Isn't that a great definition? Evil is rejection of God's will. So disobedience to, to God's will is therefore what? Participation in an experimental knowledge of evil. Now, it's the... the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? Adam already had a knowledge of good. Everything he has seen and experienced so far is good. But rejection of God's word would of necessity convey knowledge of evil to him. That's the idea. So partaking of the forbidden fruit would therefore surely give Adam knowledge of good and evil as well as the difference between them in Dr. Henry Moore says in the most intensely real way. You're in that perfect garden. God says, don't do this. There was nothing wrong with that tree at all. That tree was not evil. God simply said, I don't want you to eat of that tree to disobey God. And when you do, you now have knowledge of evil. That's the idea here. You see, God gave Adam a clear warning of the necessary consequences of disobedience. So if you reject my word, which is rejecting my love, then that is of necessity going to raise a barrier between you and me, between man and God, and it's going to break the sweet fellowship for which you were created, Adam, and that's exactly what happened. Now, God is the source of life itself. Real life is found only in communion and connection with the divine life of God. The essence of death, you guys, which is, we know, the opposite of life, is therefore what? Separation from God, which is the opposite of fellowship with God. So he says, in the day that you eat of it, you're going to surely die. The primary warning from God is spiritual death or separation from God. In other words, they had this really close relationship with God, nothing hindering. They had the life of God and sin separated them from that. That's what spiritual death is, separation from God. God said, in the day that you eat that fruit, you'll surely die. Well, wait a minute. Adam and Eve ate the fruit that day. They didn't die physically. They didn't. They kept living. Adam lived to be 900, over 900 years old. Okay. God, you said, in the day that you eat of it, you'll surely die. You will spiritually. Your life with me will stop. We will be separated. There will be a gulf between us. And that life that you've been enjoying with me will be broken and over and separated. But then, because of that, physical death will also enter the world and happen, as well as dying spiritually. Literally, when God gave the warning, it could read like this. Dying, thou shalt die. Dying spiritually today, as soon as you commit that sin, Adam and Eve, thou shalt now die physically eventually. That's the meaning. Okay. If you go to chapter 3 there in Genesis, verse 6. Eve sinned first. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves covering, coverings. Now verse 8, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord, 
God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord called to Adam and said to him, where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he, God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. It's not my fault, right? And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. It's not my fault. Now jump down to verse 21. God tells him there's going to be consequences, but then he says, also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. Where did he get those? From animals that were created, which had now to be slain and their blood shed. Question, we're not told here. Did that happen right in front of Adam and Eve? It's likely it did. Were they sheep? Possibly. And God would slay them, and, and that's a radical thing to see. That had never happened. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, that's so radical, so terrible. That's how terrible your sin is. And that blood will cover your sin. Your sin. Let me take those skins and cover your, your naked bodies, right? The moment Adam disobeyed God, the principle of decay and death began to operate in his body and in Eve's body, and now they both would eventually die physically. But when they sinned, you guys, that day, Adam died both spiritually and in principle, physically, the very day he rejected and disobeyed the word of God, that process of physical death started in his body. Now, Dr. Henry Morris says this, no longer did Adam and Eve enjoy the fellowship with God for which they had been created. That's eternal life, spiritual life. They now have spiritual death, separation from God. They hid themselves. Now, God was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. What he says is when you look at the way it's written, it indicates that this was probably a normal event, you guys, that every evening in the cool of the day, God would come and he would have an appointment with Adam and Eve for communion and fellowship, that close intimacy. Now, he says this too. This is a repeated or even continual, listen, Theophany. What's a theophany? It's an appearance of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament before he came and was born in Bethlehem. And there are many of them. Often in the Old Testament, you'll see the angel of the Lord, the burning bush, right? It says the angel of the Lord was in the burning bush and spoke to Moses as he stood there. But then he calls the angel of the Lord, the Lord and God, and he says, take your shoes off there on holy ground. Who was that in the burning bush in the Old Testament appearance of Jesus Christ? Well, what Dr. Henry Morris is saying is that before Jesus was born in Bethlehem, this is one of those visitations so that it was Jesus himself, right? And isn't that so meaningful? Because we're looking at Nicodemus sitting in front of Jesus about 6,000 or actually about 4,000 years later. Right now we figure it's been about 6,000 years since God created Adam and Eve. About 4,000 years after that, Jesus is sitting with Nicodemus. Here we are 2,000 years later, right? Now imagine it was Jesus saying, where are you, Adam? You have died spiritually. Now he says to Nicodemus, you must be born again. You see what he's saying? How can I be born again? Go back in my mother's womb and be born again? And Jesus says, I'm not talking about physical, I'm talking about spiritual. I'm talking about the spiritual life that man had and Adam gave away for everybody because he represents us all in the garden. And I want that relationship back, but there has to be bloodshed. So I have come to die on the cross that if you would believe in me, you can have that relationship again and that life of where we walk with him again. And that's what being born again is. Being born again. You might be here and you're here. I'm looking at you and you have physical life and inside you are spiritually dead. Well, you're going to exist forever, either in heaven with God or separated from him forever in hell because of your sins. But no need for that if you'll believe and receive Jesus. But if you have not given your heart to him yet and he's not living inside and you don't have that relationship and you are physically alive, but you are spiritually dead and he wants you to be born again today. In other words, to have, enter into that relationship with him. 
that's the meaning here that God is talking about. Now, I'll read to you what, what Paul says in Ephesians 2. Listen to this. How many of you have given your heart to the Lord today? Listen to what Paul says to us. I have. He says, and you, he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. You see how that makes sense? God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, born again. When a baby comes out, he enters into life. We enter into life with God, a relationship, a loving relationship with him. For by grace, a free gift, you have been saved through faith, through believing that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. You can't earn your way to heaven. You have to receive and it as a free gift by believing in Jesus. Okay, let's go back to John 3, verse 7, if you would. And Jesus talks about being born again, but he adds this, oh my gosh, this very important word, must. In John 3, 7, Jesus said to Nicodemus, do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. In other words, you guys, to go to heaven, we must be born again. Now he wants him to understand, right? He's trying to make it as simple and clear as he can. So now he takes verse 8 and he's going to use something physical, the wind, to explain it to Nicodemus. He wants him to understand. So look what he says. Jesus says, the wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Now remember, what Jesus is saying is, you're born, Nicodemus is thinking physical, right? I was born physically, do I, do I have to be born physically again? Jesus is saying, no, you need to be born of water, physically, and the spirit, born again, spiritually, and enter into a relationship with God. So he's trying to get him to understand, so now he's going to take something physical that he understands to try to help him to understand what that's like. So he takes the wind, and now... The word for spirit and wind is the same word in scripture and the context determines the meaning. Now, God says he wants us to have eternal life. And you guys, that's something to be experienced. Now, let's talk about the wind. What God is saying is this. The wind, you hear the wind physically, the Holy Spirit is spiritual. That's the third person of the Trinity, God. And I want you to, him to come inside of you and live within you. Now, the wind's invisible, right? We can't see it. So is the Holy Spirit. But both the wind and the Holy Spirit can be sensed, even though they're invisible. And the presence of both the wind and the Holy Spirit is revealed in their effects. In other words, if you were inside yesterday and you were looking out, it might have been completely calm inside and you looked out, but you saw the trees moving, the effects of the wind, right? They can, they can be sensed by their effects. Well, a person's thoughts, words, and deeds reveal the Holy Spirit is now living inside and influencing him or her. Can you control the wind? Can I? Go outside and try to grasp the wind in your hand. No way. Well, we can't control the Holy Spirit of God either because he's God. The wind has its own laws, is not answerable to human demands and orders. Either is God the Holy Spirit. The paths of the wind are mysterious. So is the Holy Spirit. And you guys, his direction in our lives may change without notice like the wind. You see the wind blowing? I was talking to you about a cloud of dust that I saw last week at Easter. I said I was walking down a dirt road, uh, and the wind was super windy, came up behind me, was blowing this way from my back, was picking dust up in the air, and I can't see the wind, but all of a sudden this cloud of dust in the wind, right, in the air. And now you can see what the wind is doing. And you guys, it was going like this. It was changing directions. Maybe you're here this morning and you're going, man, I belong to the Lord. I gave my heart to him. Where are we going now, Lord? What are you doing in my life? Trust him. Amen. Trust him. See, the Lord doesn't like us to pin him down. Oh, he'll never change. He's always faithful to his word. But you, will you follow him anywhere and will you let him do anything? And will you trust him no matter what? And that's what he wants. And you guys, only he can bring us to that place. And we can go back and forth from that place. But when, he, when we're in that place, that's a glorious place to be. That's a place of perfect peace, perfect love, perfect joy. I trust him. 
What, well, what's the answer to the problems in your life? I have no idea. But he's going to take care of it. That's how we're supposed to walk with the Lord. The wind can blow really gently. Or like in Africa right now, 140 miles an hour this last week. Holy Spirit, the same. But, you guys, after all, I, all that was just said, wait a minute. What did I not say? And this is what everyone overlooks, okay? What was the first thing Jesus said about the wind? He said, look at verse 8 again if you would. The wind blows where it wishes. But look at what he says. You what? Hear the sound of it. Everyone says, when they try to explain this passage, well, look at the, the trees blowing, whatever, you see the effects of the wind. When God comes into our lives, people will see the change. Is that true? It's totally true. But what did Jesus say? You'll hear the wind. Look at what he says. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from or where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Again, physical, spiritual, physical, spiritual. What is he saying? You hear the wind? When you're born again and you enter into a relationship with me, you'll hear the Spirit. You'll hear the voice of the Holy Spirit in your heart. And you guys, that's eternal life. That's entering into a relationship with God. How can you have a relationship with God when you can never hear Him speak? How can you have a relationship with someone when there isn't that communication? He's thinking physical, the Lord's saying spiritual. You need to be born again. Can I go into my mother's womb again physically? No. Your Adam spiritually died and you were born spiritually dead. You need to be born again, spiritually born into that relationship. Here's what it's like. You hear the wind. You'll, when you're born again, everyone who is, you will hear and know the voice of the Holy Spirit in your life. Very possible as they're speaking right then. You can hear the wind. I mean, does it say so? Is it possible? Yes. <laughs> this morning I made coffee early. It was still dark outside. And as I'm standing at the stove, you know, like you guys probably, we've got that canopy over the stove that has the, the light and the fan. And so the fan has that, it goes up with a pipe through the roof, right? Well, it's dark, whatever. I could hear that the wind was blowing outside because I could hear it blowing across the top of that. But it was quiet enough that I could hear that. I could hear the wind. It was dark, I couldn't see. You see, what did Jesus say? You hear the wind. What he's saying is when you enter into born again and you get saved and you give your life to me, you're gonna hear my voice. Last week at Easter, I was sharing, right? Then Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they know my voice and they follow me and I call them by name. My sheep hear my voice and they know my voice. He's a good <coughs> shepherd who lays his life down. Now, you guys, that's eternal life. The night Jesus died, he's praying to the Father and he says this. Jesus spoke these words in John 17. Lifted his eyes up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may also glorify you. As you have given him authority over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. What's eternal life? Well, here he says, and this is eternal life. Here's the definition. That they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. To know him, to enter into a relationship with him, is to be born again and have eternal life and to hear his voice now in your heart. It's what we live for, you guys. He wants us to, Christianity isn't just a bunch of, of do's and don'ts and rules and something we learn and know up here it's something God calls us to experience experience him the risen Lord you guys he is a, alive and, and the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within us and he wants us to experience him so we hunger and thirst for him so go after him and seek him as you hear him calling you now interesting Last book in the Bible, Jesus appears in all of his glory to this same John who wrote this, and he tells him to write seven letters to seven churches. And you guys, 
Jesus is the one speaking. It's red letter in the Bible. He's saying, I'm telling you what to write to each church. And it's for us today. And then I want you to send it in a letter to them. But at the end of each letter, he says the same thing. He says this, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Wow. In other words, you hear the wind, you'll hear the Spirit. Wow, it's through the Word of God. Read the Word of God and the Holy Spirit will speak to you. Kind of like this morning, I got up and I'm sitting there and I felt just because you learned the, the voice of the Lord, you're saying, no, it was the Lord. You say, no, it was the Lord. And he said, add down there and look up where it is and add down there that no one can come to me unless the Father draws him. So I added it. And then we get here and Joe starts praying. And all of a sudden to Joe's mind and heart from the Holy Spirit who lives within him, you hear the wind, Job hears, and he shares that scripture that comes out of his heart because he's read it before, which confirms to me, Lord, oh, you got this today. You want to speak to us. Is that God speaking? Amen. It is. Guys, that's eternal life. That's a quality of life. That's knowing God and walking with him. It's why we live, right? That's what we're passionate about. Let's go after Jesus. Let's pursue him with all of our heart. Okay, let's go to verse 9, chapter 3 in John. Nicodemus answered and said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we, remember John the Baptist is still preaching and he's come before Jesus. We speak what we know and testify what we have seen and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven. They can't because the blood of Jesus hasn't been shed yet. But he who, they're in the heart of the earth waiting at this time in paradise in Abraham's bosom. No one has ascended to heaven, but he, Jesus, is talking about himself who came down from heaven. That is the son of man who is in heaven. In other words, I came from heaven. Now look at this, you guys, verse 14 again. Jesus wants him to understand. He's trying to make it as simple and clear for him and for you and I as he can. So he says, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And we know that's talking about the cross. So now Jesus had said, you must be born again. And now he says, I must die on the cross. That whoever believes in him, verse 15, should not perish, which means be separated forever in the lake of fire, but have eternal life. You can know me and live with me forever in heaven. Wow. Wow. John 3, 16. No other single statement in the Bible so wonderfully sums up God's redemptive purpose in Jesus Christ for the whole human race. Right here in verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus tells Nicodemus, me, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Everlasting life is the same as eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Okay. Hold your place there. Go back to Genesis, but then go to the fourth book in. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, go to Numbers. It's the fourth book. And let's go to chapter 21, verse 4, because that's what Jesus is talking about here. So Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Let's go to Numbers 21, 4 and read it. And Jesus is trying to make it simple so that Nicodemus will understand how to be saved, how to be born again, how to go to heaven. And he says, I'm going to be raised up on the cross. You need to believe in me, right? Okay, so let's read it. Numbers 21, 4. After Israel left Egypt and went through the Red Sea, it says, Then they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And notice this, the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. And the people spoke against God. They started complaining and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water. And our soul loathes this worthless bread, the manna, right? Can you believe that? Well, look at verse 6. So the Lord sent fiery serpents, that's poisonous snakes, among the people. And they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses. This is the story Jesus is referring to to Nicodemus in John 3 today. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, 
We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Now, guys, look at this. And then the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent. Bronze is the metal that speaks of judgment. The serpent speaks of sin. So you have sin judged on a pole. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole. Now check this out. And so it was, if a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. Okay, does that make sense? That does not make common sense, right? So we're there. We all got bit by a snake. Pray for us, Moses. He comes back and he says, God told me to make a bronze serpent, put it on a pole. And if you'll just believe the messenger, if you'll believe the message, if you'll believe God, and you'll just look at that, you'll live. Uh -huh. Give me an injection, right? Give me some anti-venom. Come on, do something that makes sense. That makes no sense at all. I feel foolish doing that. I'm not going to do that. That was the answer. What does it say? Look at verse 9. When, if someone was bitten, when he looked at the broad serpent, he lived. So God's solution, look at the serpent on the pole to the poison of the serpent that's flowing through the veins of each victim in the story makes no sense to the reason of man. If the people who were bitten by the snakes were to escape the judgment, they must what? Believe the word of the messenger. Now what did Jesus say? He said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man, he's talking about himself, be lifted up. When did that happen? On the cross to die for our sins. Now listen, that whoever, what, believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So you know what? Looking at that snake and looking at Jesus on the cross, and believing that he died for our sins and took our place. Jesus is saying the same thing. And all you have to do to be saved, to be born again, to now enter into spiritual life, is to believe that, I, that I'm God. To believe that I took your place and paid the penalty for your sins. To let go that you can never be good enough and I'm going to let you in because you lived a good life. Throw it away. And I'm holding out a free gift, but you have to be willing to turn from your sins and follow me and enter into that relationship. Just like they walked with me in the cool of the garden, I want you to walk with me the rest of your life. And that's what Jesus is talking about. Now, Jesus said two things. Let's go back to John 3, if you guys would, and go to verse 7. Let's look at this word must. Look at verse 7, John 3. Jesus said, do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Now I'll jump down to verse 14. Jesus said, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. You must be born again, but the only way that can happen is I must die on the cross for you. Now verse 18 Jesus continues, he who believes in him, Jesus, is not condemned. But he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that the light, Jesus, has come into the world and men love darkness, their sin, rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. Look at verse 18, if you would, with me again. He who believes in Jesus, he who believes in him, is not condemned. But he who does not believe is condemned already. Now Jesus had said he didn't come to condemn the world, but to save it. When Adam sinned, you guys, God judged sin, and the whole world was under condemnation from that moment on. Still is. 
Jesus, we're not born neutral. We don't enter into condemnation when we finally die and we chose not to receive Jesus. We are under condemnation now for our sin. We are spiritually dead now unless we look at Jesus on the cross and believe in him and receive him as our Lord and Savior and enter into eternal life and are born again and our sins are all washed away. But until we do that, if you're here and you haven't given your heart to the Lord yet, you are under condemnation. But that isn't a final sentence that God passes on us because this side of heaven, once we die, there is no second chance. But that Holy Spirit, the wind, might be speaking to you even He's real. He's God this morning, taking the word of God and what we're talking about this morning and speaking to your heart and saying, you need to give your heart to Jesus today. And you guys, if you would, that condemnation is gone. And Romans 81 says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation. So have you given your heart to the Lord? God is speaking. He says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. It's another way of saying you must be born again. Peter's preaching in Acts chapter 3 after he and John were used by the Lord. A man who was lame from birth was healed. A huge crowd gathers. He's preaching and he says, Repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. Now listen, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. That's being born again. In Romans chapter 6, Paul says, After you and I are saved, do not present your members, in other words, these physical bodies, as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, born again, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Paul said in 2 Corinthians, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. That's born again. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And again, Ephesians 2, I already quoted it to you earlier. Paul said, and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Colossians 3, Paul says, if you're saved, you have put off the old man with his deeds and you have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him, the new man. That's being born again. In Titus 3, Paul said, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Listen, through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, born again. Just a couple more. First Peter 2, he says, if we're saved, if you'll get saved today, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who, listen, called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Life with God, born again, knowing Jesus. Second Peter 1, Peter says, by which, and he's talking about God's divine power, have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, the life of God, born again and walking with the Lord. <coughs> one more. First John 3. The same one who wrote the Gospel of John that we're reading today said, we know that we have passed from death, spiritual death, to life. Born again because we love the brethren. So, you guys, God wants you to stir up in you and I how much he loves us, how he died to save us, 
If you're here this morning and you haven't given your heart to him, you can give your heart to him this morning. But as we leave today, let's take what we learned today and realize that is the condition of the world out there. I know him. Do you? I am saved and born again. Are you? I'm alive spiritually and all my sins are washed away. And, and I have a wonderful relationship because I have a wonderful Savior. How about you? And people that don't know him yet don't have that yet. And they are dead in their sins and perishing. And we need to tell them you need to be born again. He died for your sins and you can know him and you need to enter into life with him. Amen. This is our risen Lord that we celebrated on Easter, but every day, you guys. So, before the worship team comes up, right where you're sitting, you go, okay, here we go. He's going to ask me <coughs> to stand up. No. Are you going to ask me to raise my hand? No. Oh, because that's a good, like last week, you asked us to come forward. Altar call. No. Right now, where you're sitting, do you want him? Do you want to know for sure you're born again and you have spiritual life and you're going to heaven? I'm going to say a prayer and pause. Don't say it out loud, but in your heart and mind, say it to him and mean it.